Well, hi, and welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset. And today we get to chat with Madeline Dale. And I have to tell you the story um, because Madeline has a podcast called the Chapter Goddess Podcast, right? Yep. And I was interviewed for that a little while ago. And of course, as I am prone to do, I told her it'll cost her. She'll now have to come on Unstoppable Mindset. That's the price, you know. Anyway, um, so she agreed to do that. And so here we are. Madeline is an author. She's a freelancer. She is a podcaster and a whole heck of a lot of other kinds of stuff. And I'm not going to give it all away because then she wouldn't have anything to talk about. And where would we be if we let that happen? So, Madeline, <laughs> welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. We're really glad you're here. Thank you for having me. I am really excited to be on and very thankful for this opportunity. So, Madeline lives in Oklahoma City. My father was from Dewey, Oklahoma. And um, and so he is no longer with us and, unless he is hovering around Dewey somewhere, but I'm not sure that that's happening. But anyway, um, I've never been to Dewey, Oklahoma. I've been to Oklahoma in various places, but never to where he was born. But one of these days, I hope to get there. Meantime, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of the early Madeline and and adventures and what it was like growing up and all that kind of stuff? Ooh, well, definitely, life was definitely full of adventures. So to kind of backtrack a little bit, I've always been an avid reader and dreamed of being an author, but I never actually thought I could go for it. But growing up, I loved reading and pretending, using my imagination to create up, create up stories and act them out, get my siblings involved. I have a little brother, a little sister. And we would always have these fun adventures, going to the creek, uh, looking for worms, playing in the mud, climbing trees, just stuff like that. And it kind of gave me different experiences that I have used now that I'm actually pursuing my dream of writing. It's given me lots of story inspiration and real life experiences to plug into my characters. So yeah, wow. that's kind of like growing up life in a nutshell for me. Wow. So were you born in Oklahoma? I was not. I was actually born in Dallas. So my mom's wow. family is from Oklahoma. My dad is from Texas. And they, I can't remember exactly how they met. I want to say it was through my Uncle Bobby. But we lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area until I was about Five before we moved back to Oklahoma to be closer to my mom's family. Hmm. Okay. And so you, you did most of your schooling then in Oklahoma. Yep. Pretty much. <laughs> there you go. Did you go to, uh, to college after high school? I did. So I graduated in 09 and went to undergrad at Southern Nazarene University in Bethany, Oklahoma, which is right outside Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. Then continued on and after getting my bachelor's of kinesiology, went to physical therapy assistant school through Oklahoma City Community College. And here I am, I have the degree, have the licensing and stuff, but I don't practice quite as much. I do it on occasion. And I'm focusing on my author career and all the mom stuff that goes with it because I am also a parent to an amazing little five-year-old who kind of drives me insane sometimes. But, <laughs> you know, what's parenthood without going crazy? On going crazy, day? right. Is there a husband involved? Oh, yeah. he oh, The good. hubby is awesome. He is the whole reason I get to pursue my dream of writing. He's been very, very supportive. We've kind of butted heads on a few things because as a creative, you don't bring in a lot of income right away, but somehow we've managed to find a way and just keep moving forward slowly. So what very is, huge shout out to my hubby for being amazing and supporting me. What does he do? He works in the restaurant business. So oh. right now he's kind of like the GM or general manager for... The restaurants he works for, and I'm not going to plug the name in because I will be scolded if I do. Um, <laughs> they're really particular about me sharing like that because yeah. of some of the stuff I write. Um, 
but well, we'll do that offline. Full. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's got his hands full with a bunch of different restaurants. He basically travels all over Oklahoma. He goes in, installs new technology, sees what he can help with them improve to make their business become more efficient, run better, work out better for customers, and just. He's got his fingers in so many things in the company. I don't know how he keeps up with it. It is like herding cats sometimes, very much so. And then you are at home and you're writing and you're momming and everything else. And and I can imagine that that can drive a body crazy after a while. But also, I bet you would say it's well worth it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So what is kinesiology? So kinesiology is basically like exercise science, studying how the body works with exercise. And I just got a funny, fancy, crazy name because I don't know. It's just kind of studying how the body works. Another term they called it was like sports medicine. Um, but kinesiology sounds fancier. Personally. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a whole lot more sophisticated than sports medicine. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, that's cool, though. So you graduated. Um, mm-hmm. And then what did you do? Um, so I worked as a physical therapy assistant for a while until my hubby and I decided we were ready to have kids. And this is kind of where life took a huge turn. We were ready. We planned it like as close to possible um, when I got pregnant and stuff. But it also kind of fell on the same year my sister was getting married. So there was all that craziness. And then after having my son, I had a lot of postpartum depression, anxiety and stuff and kind of came to a point where I'm like, okay, I have to do something different with my life. This is not the path I need to go because I was working, trying to work part time, trying to do all of the things with motherhood and it was just too much trying to do that and fight the postpartum. Mm. Uh, I did finally get help and get on medication, which made a huge difference, but it was also, I needed to make life changes, like what I wanted to pursue in life. And I gave my writing an opportunity after some encouragement from some friends and it just kind of kicked off and I fell in love with it and my mental health and everything improved from there. Because writing kind of made a huge impact on that. I was able to write out my thoughts through characters and it helped a lot. So, you know, I've said before for me after September 11th, if there is one thing that helped me deal with everything that happened, it would be that I allowed myself to be interviewed by the media so much after September 11th, literally hundreds of interviews. And they asked every kind of question that you can imagine, even some intelligent ones. But the, the point is that it forced me, although I didn't think about it at the time, to talk about September 11th and all the things that happened. And I think that it was invaluable to do. And it became essentially my therapy. And then also people started reaching out and saying, we want to hire you to come and talk about September 11th. And I chose to do that. So again, talking about it in even those arenas was helpful because it made me think about what happened. And my personality is such that I tend to want to analyze and fix and as far as September 11th, can't fix what happened directly. But I realized that whether it's September 11th or anything that occurs in our lives, there may very well be lots of things that we don't have any control over happening. September 11th, I am still not convinced that we could have predicted it. I don't think we would have had enough information to be able to predict it. And I got that from reading reports like the 9-11 report from the government and so on. But anyway, the bottom line is what we do have control over is how we choose to deal with whatever happens to us. And it's it's the same thing with you. And so you had the opportunity to sit down and begin to write and really think about your life and your world. And that has to have helped a lot. 
It did. It definitely did. And like talking with my husband a lot too, because he and I both, neither one of us realized until at least like three months in what was going on with the postpartum and everything. So we, we didn't know what it was. We hadn't ever known of anybody that had dealt with it. And I mean, now that I have, I feel like more people are coming forward about having struggled with it because maybe people are more educated about it, but I didn't know what was going on. I just was like, okay, I'm supposed to be a mom. Like I'm supposed to give all of myself to my child, which I was, but I also like mothers need to realize that they can't give all of themselves because if they don't take care of themselves first, they can't provide for those they care about. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn. And it just didn't want to stick until after I started taking anxiety medication and stuff. Is postpartum more of a physiological thing, or a neurological or or mental thing, or is it a combination? I'd say it's more of a combination because, um, oh, man, so many things influenced it. Because um, part of it, I the hormones that came with breastfeeding made mine a little bit more kind of, I want to say worse. That may not be the best fitting word for it, but... I got a little bit more, I'm going to say stable after I quit breastfeeding Mm. and all the stuff that came with that, the fear that I wasn't producing enough, the stress and everything just kind of, I didn't have that, but I still had a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And it's just, it it's so many different things wrapped into one. Mm, Yeah. I understand what you're saying. It can make life a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, I have heard of it, and um, I've, I've known people who said that they had it and worked through it, but it is kind of one of those things that does come up often, and, and I'm glad that you found ways to deal with it, and especially since you started writing. Um, oh, yeah. But you hadn't written up until that point, although you you had wanted to be a writer growing up, you say? Mm-hmm. I did, and I... I was always told that because it wasn't the best money-making career that I should put all of my work and my education and stuff behind something else, which is why I ended up going pretty much into the medical field and becoming burnt out and pregnancy and everything just kind of like snowballed into this crazy mental health circus (laughs) that I was at that point. So... How long after you began writing was your first book published? Oh, man. So I started writing before I quit working part-time, so at least a year and a half. Mm. Um, Yeah. A year and a half to two, I think, is roughly about that time period because I finished the story and tried to do the whole traditional publishing route but it didn't quite work for me because I couldn't afford to have an agent. And then I decided to give indie publishing a go and it kicked off and I've just been trucking along and writing and it's been a lot of work. It keeps me extremely busy, but it's, I love it. I love getting to share my thoughts through characters and my experience through characters and stories that pile up in my head. So you, you publish your own books. I do. Yes. Um, They're professionally edited because I do go through that whole editing process. I edit like crazy before I send it to an editor. And I have two really good editors that I work with with different manuscripts. Um, And they kind of they provide a lot of good feedback, good criticism and helps me improve. And I'm slowly eking my way into the proofreading editing kind of field, but I've still got a ways to go because I'm still learning there. But -hmm. I don't think I will ever like edit my own work because it's good to have another set of eyes. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I have collaborated on the books that I've written so far, and we're working Mm -hmm. on our third one now, which is called Tentatively a Guide Dog's Guide to Being Brave. And it's about learning to control fear. But I find that editors can be extremely invaluable. When we did Thunderdog, it was extremely helpful 
because the editor was a person who said, my job isn't to change this book and to tell you what you should and shouldn't say, but my job is to help you make this book the best it can be. Mm -hmm. And, and he did, he made some really good suggestions that we took to heart and took back to finally finishing Thunder Dog. And, and it became a, a number one New York Times bestseller. So I can't complain about his suggestions, but he didn't try to change the book. He just said, here are weak parts of the book, or here is what needs to be improved to make it a stronger read. And he was absolutely right. Yeah. And they always, it fascinates me how much extra stuff they can give you, like ideas and whatnot. And a lot of times I'm one of those people that goes over the manuscript so many times. If a word is missing, like a simple, like a, or of, or the, or something, my brain plugs it in, but it's not actually there. It's not actually there. Yeah. And that's what the editor can in part bring and to point out Mm -hmm. those things, which is what they're for. Yeah. So what was the first book that you published? Oh, so my first book was Releasing Her Power Within. It is book one of the Phase Shifter series. And this one, it's kind of based off the main character. She's a lot of who I was at the time. She's a physical therapy assistant. She's burnt out. And she's tra- struggling to deal with her mother's passing. Um, so she moves back to the country, which is based off of the area I grew up around Idaho, Oklahoma. A lot of people, if you've heard of Broken Bow or Town, like the state park there, it's very much based off of that scenery because I grew up working in the park for five years as a trail guide and stuff. And she's diving into this cabin with all her mother's stuff, her grandmother's stuff. And she discovers a huge family secret and things just kind of explode around her. She finds out magic exists. She also finds out that she's not human, that she can change into an animal. And as the story continues, she finds out more and more about her heritage and her bloodline actually connects to someone from the beginning of people in general. And it's something that's been hidden and it's also dangerous because it's tied to a whole other world of problems. Mm. So it's kind of a fantasy book. Yeah. I dabble a lot in fantasy and romance stuff and her, she's also kind of got a crazy chaotic family, has a half sister that tries to kill her. Several times and fails. So <laughs> mean old half sister. Yes. Yes. Well, so um from a standpoint of of publishing and selling books, I, I understand the whole concept of there's not necessarily a lot of money to be made, but how successful was the first book? It it did okay. Um I learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, starting out, I didn't have a lot to put into funding. So one of the things I ended up changing was like the cover. I think it went through three different covers before I finally found something that stuck and was good for the rest of the series because there's four books with some spinoffs in the work. Um, yeah, I had, to, had a hard lesson of why you need to go with a good professional looking cover instead of doing it on your own when you don't have the skills to do that. Mm hmm. So, yeah, I know that uh, for me personally, I don't do pictures and art very well. So I am very glad to have others do that. Yeah. Just because it isn't going to be the thing that uh, that works well. So you have five books in that series altogether? Um, four in that with a spinoff in the works. And then I, the spinoff stuff is going to be more of a short on the shorter stories. Mm-hmm. They're kind of, I'm trying to finish the trilogy that's going to be done this year before I go back to do the spinoffs. So, ah, well, so how is all your training and your upbringing and other things like that? How does all that feed into making your books and what you do better? 
um, like you, you had postpartum depression and so on. So you've obviously dealt a lot with healthcare or healthcare is certainly something you focus on. How does that enter into what you do as a writer? So as I write my stories, all my characters, there is a couple of scenes and stuff where they have to kind of question their own personal mental health and their sanity, like how they can work through something. Um, I'm going to use Liz as an example in the Face Shifter series. She does not know how to do any self-care. She doesn't know how to get herself out of a burned out state to get back where she can function and go back to working and enjoying life. And then in the Ember series, she has so much emotional trauma dumped on her from where the story starts to where book three picks up that she has to figure out how to work through it, how to deal with all the grief, all the loss and all of the weight of so many important decisions crushing her to keep moving forward because if she becomes stagnant and doesn't move, the world's going to fall apart, literally. So you're using these books also to convey life lessons that you've learned along the way. Yes. And they totally didn't start out like that, but that's how they've kind of come along the way. But doesn't that make them stronger because you make it personal in a way, even though it doesn't necessarily look like it to people who don't know? I think so, because it kind of gives the reader more to identify with as they read. They're like, oh, hey, I get that. I have felt the same way or I've struggled with the same kind of issue. And it gives them a way to relate to that character to keep them interested in this person, in the problems that are going on, and move them through the action. Well, you mentioned Ember, um, Mm -hmm. and and in any of your series, how do the characters change over time? So how does Ember change and evolve over time? So Ember is one of my favorites for this kind of question. She, at the start of the series, believes she's a latent wolf. Um, she's stuck in this contract her parents made with their Pax Alpha because she's grown up in a wolf pack. She thinks she's a wolf. There's shifters. There's magic. But on one of her days training, she's with her lover who she's had this secret relationship going on because she is not, has zero feelings for the guy she's in contract to marry. Um, And he doesn't really have feelings for her. Neither one of them want to be in the contract, but they can't break the contract because the alpha bound it with magic. Um, And the only way to unbind it is to convince him to let them go um, until the one she's bound to becomes the alpha. But that day in training, they come across a house fire. Her childhood best friend's home is in flames. And she rushes up thinking she can help them because somebody's stuck under a pile of wood of debris that's fallen down and it's on fire, but the flames are black, which is different because normally fire is not black. And she helps the person out. It's supposed to be her friend's mother, but it's not. It's a demon, an imp impersonating the person. And she touches the flames, but instead of it burning her, her body absorbs it. And this kicks into gear the release of her hellhound because her mother has a secret. She had a one night stand with the devil and Amber was the result, but none of, no one knows the secret except for her mother and her father that's raised her. And as the story progresses, she has to figure out how to control her magic, how she can unlock it. And she gets taken, kidnapped to hell, has to escape. And it's just like left and right, she's thrown all of these changes, all of these secrets that have been hidden. And in the process, she gets thrown in the middle of a war that's been happening slowly and that increases in speed with her, with the revelation that Lucifer has an heir to the throne. And one of the fallen, the seven deadly sins, you know, Mm -hmm. one of them is 
finally makes their move on Lucifer to try to take him down and Ember's thrown into this and a war is coming and she's got to be able to lead all of those who are on Lucifer's side against the other side. Wow, yeah. you are going in a, a whole lot of different directions with this, aren't you? Yeah, she has to grow from being this small town teenager to the heir of hell and being able to lead all of these people, all of these armies, and it's all resting on her shoulders with the loss of different people that are close to her that I'm going to not say. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to because a lot of the grief she has to work through and grow is because several of those who are close to her, something happens to them. They don't all necessarily die, but some of them do. And that's a lot on any person. Sure. And um, obviously, I am presuming that in the long run, that helps her grow. Oh, yeah. She, by the end of book three... She's going to have more power than any other angel or demon or anyone except her father in hell um, because she's also got other abilities that a lot of the other hellhounds do not have because she's got such powerful blood running through her veins because she is Lucifer's daughter. It gives her stronger abilities and magical connections that no one else has. But I'm presuming that Ember overall is supposed to be a good person. She is. So, and I guess a little backtrack, Lucifer and hell are not quite the same thing as what you would find like in the Bible. It's not all brimstone and fire. It's actually kind of like another version of earth, but instead of people going there to be enslaved and be put in chains and stuff, they go there to heal and be given a second chance to make up for the things they've done in life. Mm. Now, there are those that are beyond that that are put somewhere else in hell, but ultimately the whole point of them and our point of hell in the story is a second chance. Now, is there a heaven that gets associated with this somewhere on the line or is that Absolutely. Okay. So... In book three, on top of the war and everything that Ember's coming to face, she's also got to stop this person that's tr tried to take Lucifer down. She's got to stop them from breaking down the gate that leads to heaven because he wants to do it, go through the gate to bring the attack on heaven and bring everybody back up. And with Lucifer down, injured, dead, I'm not going to say what happens to him. It weakens the power of the gate and makes it where somebody else can access it. Hmm. So book three is what you're working on now or it's yes. it's not out yet? Yeah. Okay. Will it be the end of the series or will there be more? So that's the game plan. There are some spinoff series that are going to kind of start up, come after um, with focus on different characters. I have an idea for kind of like a prequel of how Lucifer and her mother, Kyra, meet and how that kind of leads into things. Um, and then there's a couple of characters in the story that are really close to Ember. Um, one being her sister, who I'm not going to say what happens, but she has some stuff happen that transforms her into a creature that has not existed before or one that they've never had record of. And I kind of want to give my readers that story too because she's going to come back she's going to make an appearance in book three as this new creature mm. and she's only mentioned of becoming this in book two so mm. pretty vivid imagination all the way around how did you create all this how did this yeah. come up i honestly a lot of different things played into this the idea kind of came from a dream i had um and then it just kind of slowly build. I've built from there. I've always really liked urban fantasy and fantasy in general. And this kind of mashes it all together. So it's just, yeah, I just took it away and let the characters kind of lead me a little bit where they wanted it to go. Because I put a rough 
outline down to follow. And it's just kind of exploded from there. Yeah, I think there is something to be said for letting characters drive the story because um, what it really means is your creativity is coming out. And if the characters really tell the story and you are the scribe that puts that down, then you're really sticking more to a story that I think needs to be told. Yeah, it would make sense. And my books, I predominantly write in first person. So it's actually easy to kind of put out there what their what their what's actually going on with their thoughts, with their mental feelings and everything. Yeah. Which makes which makes for for interesting stories all the way around. What kind of challenges do you face as an author? I mean, there are obviously struggles and things that occur. So tell us about that a little bit. So something I I feel like is my biggest struggle is time management. No matter how many lists and whatnot, I plan out things. I can never get things done as fast as I want. Um, And I've kind of learned to be a little more forgiving with myself when I don't meet those things. Because as an independent author, I get to make my own deadlines for when my books come out when I'm going to have something done. And that's something I've had to really make myself learn and still have struggle with a little bit on this adventure. And it's just, and then as my son interrupts parenting while finding all the balance to do this stuff as well, trying to space that out and to make sure he gets plenty of stuff. Harrison. <laughs> I see it. No, hey, go let me finish. No. Yes, yeah, go make some more clay figures. Okay, go, go. I'll come back when you're. Okay, I'll come get you when I'm done. <laughs> Balancing part, that part with of everything. the plot. Part of the yes. plot. Yes. Um, and just also finding time to take care of myself with self care and giving my brain like a mental break. Something I've picked up probably in the last year is. Um, which was recommended by another author friend of mine is just doing nothing like set a time aside, like 15, 20 minutes just to do nothing. Don't look at anything. Don't look at your phone, a book or anything. Just relax. You can meditate or just stare at the ceiling. Like it's kind of a form of meditation in and of itself. It is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of value in that because Thinking is as much a process and as much a process that can you can use up your energy as anything else. And we often don't slow down and just take time to think. If we do, we find out how much better our lives really are, although we, we, we may not realize it at the time. But if we start taking time every day to think and analyze and how how did it go or what did I miss here or um, how do I not let that happen again or, or how do I improve what I'm doing or why did this go so well and just think about them without really forcing yourself to and just letting things come as they as they come is always a valuable thing to do yeah and it's definitely given me a different perspective on things I've kind of started organizing things a little bit better. Like my thoughts are a little more organized as well. Yeah. So it works out for you though. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's made things a little, definitely a lot smoother. How many books do you publish a year or do you have enough of an average to really know that? Well, so the book that's with the editor right now is book number is going to be I call I go by story because it's such a like I don't know it's a controversy about how thick an actual novel is and whatnot but I have this is book 19 that's what's the editor um so a year I my plan is to do at least three per year with a couple of short stories here and there if that like something comes up and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just going to play with this idea and put it out. Um, Because I've submitted a couple of short stories to different anthologies and they've they've been published too. So, Well, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Well, have um, 
So have you, in addition to those stories, have you submitted anything else anywhere that's been published in any kind of a mainstream way or part of any other organ that was published? Um, I think a couple of short stories have been, um, Deal Some Blood was with um, A.A. Warren Publishing that just dropped this last, wait, oh, beginning of this month, if not last month. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, wait, still June. Um, and I think when I've got another story with her, I think it's supposed to drop around Christmas. It was supposed to do last Christmas, but we ended, she ended up bumping it because not everybody got their stuff done. Um, I have a retelling of Red Riding Hood that was with Red Penguin Publishing. Um, I think that might be it. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but those are the top like ones I can remember. <laughs> Fair. And have have they have any of your books been published in any kind of audio format or are they just all in print or electronic? So, or? Right now they're in print and electronic only. I'm slowly trying to get into the audiobooks because I listen to a lot of audiobooks myself. But having the right person and having the money to do it at the same time has not worked out yet. Um, but I think I finally found the person to do it. I just got to get the money saved up. So there is that. Mm -hmm. There is, there's always that, that, uh, that gets in the way sometimes of things, but it's still part of what has to happen. Yeah. So tell us some of the other things. I know you have a lot of other stuff going on besides writing. Tell us about some of the other things. So as you mentioned earlier, I podcast, I bring different creatives on my podcast channel, which goes to YouTube as well. Um, so there's video recording and audio ver version of the conversation. And I do that pretty much weekly. Um, I've slowly transitioned to doing them live instead of recording like I was before. Um, kind of cuts back on some of the editing time. And I've had less interruptions from my son. That's kind of the reason I was doing edits before. I also blog, freelance. I host for Go Indie Now um, on several different shows. This past spring, I have done This Week in Indies, Character Driven, and Talking Indie Mayhem, which is part of the game show Go Indie Now has called Indie Mayhem, where indie creatives get together and kind of answer funny, crazy questions. And in the fall, I'm going to be doing, as of right now, only character driven in this week in Indies. Mm. What is Go Windy Now? So Go Windy Now is a wide kind of like company encompassing different independent art artists in general. So this could be... Um, Indie video or indie movie makers, indie authors, indie musicians, like anybody in the independent creative field. And Joe Compton is the one who is the head of it all. He puts together a ton of different shows, a lot of informational shows, a lot of fun shows, gets indies out there gets their books kind of out there for people to check out, lets you meet their authentic personality and whatnot on the shows. Um, and it's just, it's been a great way to connect with others in the indie community as well. I have fallen into a group of authors that I bounce ideas and stuff off of because of the things I've helped with on the show. So. As an author um, who clearly has some visibility. So have you been invited to go speak anywhere like at libraries or schools or anything like that? I, so I haven't been asked to speak, but I was asked to mentor other students in college, which I did that for two or three years during undergrad. I can't remember how long I did it. Um, but it was it was really eye-opening because it gave me a different perspective of some of the other things others struggle with. So for those of you guys listening, I have a TBI, traumatic brain injury, and it's 
kind of caused issues with my executive functioning because it's left scar tissue on my frontal lobe. Um, I've also had, unfortunately, multiple concussions since then. One second severe head injury in the midst of that. I don't remember exactly the details on it because I lost vision and consciousness for a little bit. I was by myself when it happened. And thankfully it was before touchscreen phone that before I had a touchscreen phone because I had the buttons memorized and was able to call for help, but I could not see anything for like two or three hours on that one. But it's just kind of like, it makes things really difficult for me to organize and I'm also ADHD on top of that. So I bounce around, move a lot. As you guys have probably noticed <laughs> during this interview, I wiggle in my chair a lot. But yeah, just pushing through, not really so much pushing through as learning how to find the path that works best for me with that has also helped me help others because I'm able to give them, hey, this worked for me. Maybe it'll help you kind of stuff. Sorry, I went on a tangent. <laughs> no, 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 no. That That's what this is all about, is having a conversation. And conversations do go off on tangents, and that's what makes them fun. So it's okay. Not a not a problem at all. But I do want to go back to something. Um, and I, we touched on it briefly, but I'd like to explore it a little more. Mm-hmm. When your characters are literally writing the story through you, and you're in the middle of something what happens when suddenly they change or something changes and they go off on a tangent or in a different direction? How does that affect you? And how do you deal with that? Well, if I'm writing, I kind of zone out and sit there for a minute. Cause I'm like, wait, where is this going? How does this go into the story? Um, and sometimes I have to go back and like rewrite scenes or just redo things completely. Uh, a lot of times those kind of thoughts and ideas hit me while I'm like doing the dishes or something. And I'm like, seriously, right now, I cannot go write this down. Like, you're just going to have to wait. And then it's just, it's crazy. So, but a lot of times I will try to put it on my phone. Like I'll jot it down in a note or I have so many notebooks, like little bitty notebooks. Where's my other one? Like a little one right here. Stuff gets written down. And half the time, if you were to look at it, you'd be like, what? is this it'd be like a word or an acronym or something but it makes sense to me so well that's the important part at least then you can translate it and deal with it but um what if you say wait a minute and then the character says nope this has got to come out right now yeah then a lot of times either i figure out how to make it work or it gets lost which has happened a lot (laughs) does it get lost or do you put it somewhere and then maybe come back to it it or some lost. of all of that. It gets More lost. Often, huh? Yeah. And a lot of times I've gotten better about dictating things to a note on ah. my phone. Um, that's kind of been a work, work in progress. Still kind of is because sometimes it doesn't like to pick up the words and it puts something crazy weird in there. And I'm like, I don't even know what I was trying to say here. <laughs> so, Yeah. Voice recognition is not perfect yet. Mm-mm. Well, just be careful. You don't want Ember to take over completely. No, my life could probably get a little bit chaotic if she did. So also, I don't have magic and I can't turn into this awesome hellhound. Well, uh, that's okay. Um, You're different than she. So Mm -hmm. you you need to be her representative here, which is which is still okay. Another thing you mentioned, urban fantasy, as opposed to um, I get what I guess what other kinds of fantasy. Um, What is what is urban fantasy and why do you like it or? Or what made you choose it? So urban fantasy for me, and a lot of people may have a different kind of descriptor for this, but it's where you pull in the real world in with the fantasy kind of stuff. So with mine, a lot of it, I'm pulling ideas and places and scenery from my hometown that I grew up in. And there's a lot of forests, a lot of trees, different places, um, In the face shifters, there's a lot of different places that I name that are actually places, but they're not in the spot they are in the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, Pulling things like that in our everyday life into this fantasy world 
is what I would say is more urban fantasy versus like high fantasy. You get to make up everything. You get to make up the scenery, the world, the religions, the beliefs, the magic system, everything. It would seem then that something like Harry Potter is kind of a combination of the two. Yeah, I definitely would say so, because he's got his real world and then the magical world there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you see a little bit of both in there. But fantasy is, is fun. Fantasy and science fiction are fun, because I find that a lot of the times when I read it, the author is really talking about themselves, and they allow that to happen. They just do it in a, a different kind of, well, disguise is the wrong word, but they they do it inside of another picture. Yeah, I, I agree, because as I mentioned earlier, like a lot of the things in life that I've experienced and stuff, working through them, I've been able to process them better by them coming, that, like the stuff happening to me, coming out through the character in the character's world and the character's life and how I see them processing through it. it kind of makes me stop and be like, okay, like I can do that same kind of thing minus like the magic. So, well, as as a writer, and not just your characters, but in general, how do you see character development? And we'll say because it's where your expertise is, female characters. How are are they evolving overall in the whole? genre of writing as opposed to the way they used to be what's what's changing and what's changed so that is a fantastic question because when I was young picking up a book on the bookshelf and library and stuff a lot of times the main character the protagonist was always male it was the, the males and the men they all got to go on the adventures women were typically written as a damsel in distress uh needed rescuing but nowadays you see more and more of the woman coming in and being the strong person, being the hero, being the one that saves everybody, being the one that rescues the world from falling into chaos. And I feel that's been a huge growth and speaks volumes to hopefully what's been growth in our culture with the female position in the world, um, especially moving towards more equality. But it's just so much, it's so wonderful to see and write a strong female character because putting myself in that strong female character's shoes, I get to be the hero. Like I get to be the one that saves everyone. And that's also an outlet for those women who are scared to step out and be themselves and show the world who they really are. Why do you think men are reacting to that? I mean, I've had a lot of male readers like the female characters and i've actually seen a lot of male authors create strong female characters too um and i don't know if that's just kind of like a change that's happened because women are stepping out and stepping up more to do more to claim their strength but it also creates variety i mean there's still books out there with male protagonists that are strong but there's more variety in the field now than there were before. So hopefully not all men are opposed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's definitely room for strong men, um, but strong women as well. And it, it makes sense to, to see that evolution taking place. And I, I go back to Harry Potter again. Um, Hermione Granger in Harry Potter is certainly as strong as anyone in that series. And yes. she brings a lot to it. Um, and and others in that series as well. I'm Professor McGonagall is, is another one. You can tell I've read the series actually more than once. Um, and there are things about that kind of writing that I enjoy because it really helps I think, especially with kids and maybe shy kids who don't think they can do things, and then yet they see the characters in those books evolve and do so many things that, gee, maybe I could do more than I thought I could. And I assume that that's kind of somewhat what happens with your writing as well. I, I think so. I feel so now that you've said it. It definitely does follow along those lines because, like, Liz, for example, she 
discovers there's more to her and she has way more responsibilities put on her than she ever thought she would have because she was trying to find an easier lifestyle, one where she could like de-stress, relax, but it turns out she's a princess and a higher person in her clan, both of like different worlds. And it's kind of, she has to figure out how to still find what she wants and fulfill those shoes. And she just wants to be the quiet, left alone person, doesn't think she can do certain things. And here she is. She accomplishes so much. And so when are Liz and Ember going to meet or have that? Oh, man. I So I've toyed with the idea of a crossover because at the end of book four of the phase shifters, I kind of leave it open for things to happen. And I did this before I even wrote the Ember series because in the phase shifter series, the portals to all the different worlds, all the different kind of like a multiverse theory, um, like Dr. Strange and everybody in the MC, there's different worlds, different timelines and everything. And in the phase shifters, all of that stuff is, they start opening those things again. So Ember's off here in her own little world and Liz is still off in hers right now, but there's an opportunity that they could cross over. The idea has been kind of in the back of my mind because of the portals opening. But the two haven't uh, crossed over and met yet and then come to tell you time to do something different. They've talked about it. I'm not going to lie. They have talked about it. They've talked about it. Okay. I can't do this yet, guys. I'm not there. So my ideas come faster than I'm able to get them down. Yeah, well, okay. That gives you security of things to work toward. Mm -hmm. So how do you evolve as a writer? How are you improving and what do you do to improve your skills and become a better writer? You've been doing this now, what, five years, you said? Three, actually. Well, three. So okay. So since I, your son was born, three years. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess so, technically I started writing before that, but I didn't start the publishing journey until three years ago. Right. So how do you work to improve and become a better writer as you go? So for me, I still read a lot. Um, not nearly as much as I did before I became an author. And obviously before I became a mom, because that takes even more time away from getting to read. But I try my best to include books about the structure of a novel or grammar or stuff like that. And then just talking with other authors, being on chats like this one that we're having now, getting to talk with other authors. There's so much you can take away from the conversation, tidbits of information and knowledge regarding writing, marketing social media, et cetera, like just from having those conversations. Um, Also reaching out and getting in groups or finding workshops, online workshops, going to conventions, which is something I've added in the past year to try to do more of, mostly because it's a little bit more pricey on the financial end. Yeah, like going to things like that and just taking in as much as I can, when I can, but more than anything, continuing to read, continuing to read other authors, like in the genre I write, keeping up with how things change, and then doing my best to stick with the changes that come also with social media. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it is a, well, it is a process where ongoing improvement, ongoing growth is, is as important for you as it is for your characters and they can help, but there are also parts of it that they don't know how to do. And that's the actual writing part of it. So obviously it's good that you can grow and improve and that you found ways to do that. Yeah. Which is cool. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're not writing? And I know you're always going to be a mom. But what are the kinds of uh, external activities do you like to do? So outside of writing and doing anything author stuff, I am now homeschooling my son. So I do a lot of research on different topics to help him learn and grow. Um, We've been 
doing a lot more unit studies as of late, just to kind of learn about different topics, like what holiday is going on right now, how it's important when we started doing it, things like that. I also like to hike and travel and get outdoors whenever I can. We spend right now, since it's the warmer months, we're kind of outside in the morning. I have a garden and it's grown a lot over the years, kind of took over the backyard. There's like this play area and then garden stuff kind of everywhere else. So it keeps me busy. And then, yeah, just traveling and visiting friends and family. Where all of you traveled? Um, I have been to, so we've been several places in Texas. We went to New Mexico about a year ago, uh, Colorado, um, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana. Someday you'll have to get out here to California. Yes, that's that's on my bucket list. Um, Missouri, we spent, we've been to Missouri, Texas, Arkansas multiple times over the, like, yeah. every year. That's like a common thing. Um, just slowly getting further and further out there to visit and explore things. So, Do you get a lot of snow in the winter? No. I w- Well, yeah. okay, sometimes we do, but... More often than not, it's ice. It's <laughs> so ice, yeah. Ice storms, and we do snowstorms. Um, no fun. Tornadoes with ice. are apparently our specialty, though. So, oh, oh, isn't that special and lovely? Yeah. We had a tornado out here in the Los Angeles area earlier this year. Ooh. It's the first one in like forty years, so it isn't like it hasn't ever happened. But still, yeah, they're no fun. Yeah. And- the weather we is all started getting them in January this year. And I was like, okay, like, what does that mean for spring? And of course, it's kind of been crazy. I mean, they haven't been as bad as the ones we've had in, I want to say 2013, mm. or the really, really bad ones. We actually made national news um, with more and, and the El Reno tornadoes that had so much damage. Um, but this year, we've had quite a few um, move through. Well, if you were to have one thing that you'd like to advise would-be authors or others who might be interested in authoring, um, if you had one thing you would tell them or advice you'd give them, what would it be? Mm, Don't be afraid to reach out to authors you look up to. You would be surprised because they're just people too. You can always ask them for tips and advice. A lot of times, they'll give it to you. They'll give you thoughts or ideas. Don't ask them to look over your manuscript because that's a little too much, but you can be like, send them a question like, Hey, if you could, I don't know. Yeah. Like whatever question, but don't ask them to look over your manuscript. Do have that with reached, like beta readers or an editor. Have you reached out to any authors who are famous that we might've heard of? Um, oh, yes. What was her name? Mary Pope Osborne was the first one I actually like hand wrote a letter to because I loved the Magic Treehouse books as a kid. And she actually did write back to me and I was blown away. And now since I'm older and whatnot, reaching out to some of the authors I've read, I've actually got to like meet in person Mm. or chat with like we are over Zoom or something. And it's been it kind of makes you step back and be like, holy cow, I'm actually living this world. It's no longer just like a fantasy idea. I'm actually getting to meet this person and trying to not have that like star struck fan rambling thing happen. It's kind of funny sometimes. Yeah, I hear you. Well, and I would say everyone has a story to tell and more people should be unafraid or not afraid to tell their stories. And even if you feel you aren't a great writer, write it down. You can always find others who would be willing to help. But that's why we do Unstoppable Mindset, because I believe everyone has a story to tell that's relevant to bring to our podcast and that stories will inspire others. And we never know who will be inspired or take something solid from what we did here today or what we ever do on Unstoppable Mindset. So it's a lot of fun to do. And I enjoy the learning experience myself, so I can't complain a bit about it. Yes. 
Well, I want to thank you for being here with us. This is great. Um, I enjoyed being on the Chapter Goddess, and I'm hoping that you enjoyed being on Unstoppable Mindset and that we we had a, a good time. If you ever want to come back on and tell us more about what's happening with books, I definitely want to hear when Ember and Liz get together. Um, that's important. That I, I bet it's going to happen at some point, and I think it will be fun. But we really appreciate you being here. And if you know of other people who we ought to have as guests on Unstoppable Mindset, please let us know. And for all of you out there, if you know anyone who ought to be on Unstoppable Mindset, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact me. Well, let me, before I do that, how do people contact you? So you guys can check me out on my website. It's the best place to find me. And I have connections to all of my social media there. It's www.thechaptergoddess.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, you can email me there, reach out, check out my YouTube channels, my podcasts. I'm on Apple, Google, Amazon um, with a podcast. Books are wide, and I am very thankful for getting to be on the show today. Well, again, thank you for doing it, and we do want to stay in touch. And as I said earlier, if you'd like to reach out to us, wherever you are listening, please feel free to reach out to me, Michael H I at accessibe, a c c e s s i b e dot com, or go to our podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson.com dot com slash podcast. Michael Hinkson is M I C H A E L H I N G S O N dot com slash podcast. And we would appreciate a five star rating wherever you're listening to this. We love getting ratings and especially those five star ones. We hope that podcasts are always interesting enough to, to get that from you. We value your input, we value your comments and your thoughts. So please don't hesitate to give us a rating and a review. We value it greatly. But again, Madeline, I want to tell you that we're really grateful that you came on today and we really appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you for having me.